Uh, normally, during this time, I will preach, but today, because it's my first Sunday and everything that we've had going on, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about myself and let you know what sort of perspective I have on pastoral ministry. Uh, first, let me say uh, thank you for telling me your name more than twice. <laughs> um, if you have any clever mnemonic devices, uh, word associations, or helping me learn your name, I would appreciate that. In my first appointment, I had a woman who was a great seamstress, and she made a white stole that I, I wear during the Easter season. Uh, her last name was Bush, and she bore a resemblance to Barbara. So in that case, it was easy for me to remember that. I had another couple in that church who were music teachers, and they were also active in the choir of that church. And they told me their last name was Harmon. They said, you can think of harmony, music, that's okay. So take a week or two to think about your name <laughs> and any sort of clever device like that that you can use to help you. My life as a United Methodist began when I was three months old. In January 1970, at Sharp Memorial United Methodist Church in Young Harris, Georgia, in Towns County in the North Georgia Mountains, I was baptized by the Reverend Dr. John Wesley Kay. Dr. Kay placed his hand on my head and baptized me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I became a part of the United Methodist family at that time. Dr. K was one of 11 children. And some of you who are fans of Southern literature may know his brother, Terry K, who wrote To Dance with the White Dog, was made into a movie with Jessica Tandy and June Cronin. We lived there because Young Harris College is in that small community. At that time, it was a two-year junior college, and my father was the president of the college. He began his professional life as a professor of English and theater, but by the time I was born, he was in administration. I was the last born of three. My sisters were 12 and 14 at the time I was born, and my 14-year-old sister when they had a family meeting to let them know that our mother was expecting a child, cried. <laughs> and she said she was embarrassed and did not know how she would face her parents. <laughs> and my dad said to her, well, Julie, buck up because this child is on his way. <laughs> we moved from there to Meisenheimer, North Carolina where my father was president of then Pfeiffer College. Uh, later, Pfeiffer became a university, just like Young Harris became a four-year school. Uh, and it was at that time, very early on, uh, that I lost my mother, unexpectedly, in an automobile accident. Uh, within about a couple of years of that, my father remarried. And so I had a stepmother, I had my older sisters, and I had a beloved a housekeeper by the name of Miss Amy Ford, who were sort of my maternal caregivers during that time period. When I was about seven, we moved from there to Nashville, Tennessee, where my father was president of SCARE, uh, then graduate school. And so we lived there until about age 10 for me. So that means I was grew up on college campuses in my early years, and I was born in the mountains. So I tend to feel at home when I am close to a college campus or I'm in the mountains. So you've got both of those guys. Uh, at the age of 10, we moved to my, the town where my father grew up. Um, my father and mother lived next door to each other. And uh, his mother was still, or his oldest sister who reared him, was still living there at the time. And also, at that time, my maternal grandmother was living, too. So I grew up in my junior high and high school years in a small South Georgia town. 
So I had the experience of living and going to church in larger areas, but also in a rural community. It was at age 14 when my father's second marriage ended in divorce. And that was a tough time for me, in addition to uh, trying to cope with the loss of someone who was very close to me. It was also adolescence, which I don't think is fun for any of us. And it was during that anxious time that I sort of cried out angrily to God, giving myself over to Jesus Christ. And that is the moment that I would consider to be my conversion experience. And it was around that time period that I also felt a calling to go into pastoral ministry. And I dove into the life of the church very zealously. And I even started writing my own sermons. Uh, my father was a very gifted public speaker. Uh, when he went to college early on, he went to Young Harris, where I was born. And he had three roommates. Um, all three of the roommates became United Methodist pastors. He's the only one who did it. But he did a lot of public speaking, and he did a lot of lay speaking. And so from watching him, I kind of developed a, a sense of how it was done. And once my pastor found out that I was doing this, I got on sort of a fill-in circuit to preach or to fill in for pastors who were vacationing or who were gone on sick leave uh, during my time. I, this is something that was met with great acclaim and with great praise from congregations when I presented myself to them. Of course, later I realized that when you're a teenager and you get up in the, in the pulpit and you read the Bible and you say anything, that's going to impress adults. I don't know how polished my sermon was at that time. My experience took a different turn later in high school. Uh, my father had received an invitation from one of his old classmates for me to go and spend the summer working in a church where he was a pastor. He was a pastor of a very large church, one of the largest, in the Pacific Northwest Conference in the city of Edmonds, which is a northern Seattle suburb. So I got the opportunity to both work in a large church and also work in a church that was in a different part of the country from the one I was used to. And to get a sense of what United Methodism is like in that part of the world. I did two summers of that, one before my senior year of high school and one after my senior year of high school. And then in between my first year and second year of college, I followed the youth pastor there that I was working with to work for a summer in Panama City, Florida. So I had the opportunity to work in large churches around and gain these new experiences. My higher education work began when I returned to the place I was born, you know, Harris College. And like my father, I made the closest and strongest friendships of my life when I was in this small, cloistered environment. And after that, I transferred to the University of Georgia, where I got a bachelor's in speech communication. And it was about that time that I no longer felt called to pastoral ministry in the way that I used to. And I was confused about what was going on with me and not really sure what to make of it. I did another summer internship thinking, well, maybe that would kind of get me in the mood again. I went back to the Pacific Northwest, working with the same youth minister I worked with before. This time in SWIM, which is on the northern end of the Olympic Peninsula just across the bay from Vancouver, British Columbia. And I worked there for a summer, and it was nice, but I still had these questions. I entered seminary, and I loved it. I loved the environment. Uh, Dean and I are big learners and readers. We are uh, devoted to lifelong learning. And so it's easy for us to get adapted to an academic environment. And while I was in seminary and going through my courses and still having this questioning, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it, but I was worried. And so I approached the pastor of a church that I had been working with and was able through her to go see a pastoral counselor. And that helped me kind of work through some issues 
that I had long buried within me. One day, I was in class studying psychology and religion with Dr. Jim Fowler. He wrote a landmark book entitled Stages of Faith. For those of you who have studied psychology, you might have studied the work of Erickson, who talks about the stages of development and maturity. Dr. Fowler did the same thing for religious faith. And in this lecture, he was talking about adolescents who take on adult characteristics. And when they do this, other adults see them, and they are impressed, and they praise the adolescent for doing this. And the danger of what happens is the adolescent then takes on adult responsibilities before he's ready and robs himself of his childhood. And I had an epiphany at that moment. And I realized that was my story. And I came to the conclusion, unnerving as it was to me, that I couldn't enter pastoral ministry after seminary. It was also even more so unnerving to my family at the time. We had a lot of heated discussions about that. But I decided that that was not the right thing for me to do. So during my last year of seminary, as I was finishing up, I had a conversation with a man who, a work, who worshipped in the church that I was attending at that time. And he worked for a United Methodist Conference and Retreat Facility. And he asked me, well, do you have specific plans for after seminary? And I said to him very quickly, no, what do you have in mind? And he kind of rolled his eyes and he gave me his business card and he said, let me think about it. Well, long story short, I was able to work for that conference center in guest services and then later in group sales for eight years. And I was able then to find a church that I liked and to attend that church where I could feel at home and become involved. And I was very intentional during that time period about feeling what it feels like to be a lay person. And realizing that at that point in my life, I may never become a pastor. In our tradition, early on when people are considering going into the ministry, they are encouraged to find some sort of a biblical metaphor that can match with what they have experienced from God's calling on them. And a lot of my colleagues choose the metaphor of fleeing the call. Someone like Jonah, who goes in the opposite direction when God calls him. Or someone like Moses, who tries to talk God out of him when he encounters God in the burning bush. Or Peter, who tries to put Jesus at bay, saying, you don't know me, I'm very sinful. And a lot of my colleagues sort of use that analogy for why they are second career pastors. And I feel like maybe we've overdone that a little bit in our denomination. I heard those calling stories differently when I sat in the pew and heard it explained. And these pastors were talking about running from this terrible thing and getting beaten up and finally, okay, God, I relent, I'll give in. And when I sat where you're sitting, I thought, wait a minute, what is this awful thing that these preachers talk about running from. It's been in my past. What's so hideous about that? And I think some of these preachers, well-intentioned, grabbing onto the metaphor, just need to cut themselves some slack. I believe what happens to a lot of us is that we have our younger years and we look at pastors and we look at worship leaders as these kind of shining, larger-than-life figures in big robes in the pulpit, and we can't relate. And then we grow up, and we marry, and we have families, and start jobs, and we get more involved in the church. And we become involved with the pastors and realize, you know, they're much like I am. I think I could do that too. I think that's probably more close to people's stories. But if I were to choose a biblical metaphor for that period of my life, I wasn't running from the call. But looking back, I think that was the wilderness period. Wilderness in the Bible is the period in between two significant events. There is the freedom from slavery in Egypt and the attaining of the promised land. But 40 years of wilderness in between. Wilderness where God is very much present. 
in the form of water and manna and quail. And God is a visual presence in the form of fire and a cloud. Are those wilderness periods that certain biblical figures go through before beginning a significant ministry? The Apostle Paul, after he goes to Damascus, and Ananias places his hands on him, and the scales fall from his eyes, he goes out into the wilderness. Long before he founds any churches or writes any letters, he goes out into the wilderness to prepare himself. And so I think that period of time for many is sort of like my wilderness period, where I learn what it feels like to be a laborer. So that at this point in my life, I can more properly relate. I also got the opportunity to find my childhood again. I adopted the hobby of community theater. Now, even though I grew up in a household that appreciated theater, I didn't have any formal training, unlike Dina who does. So that means when I was in a play, or whenever I was fortunate enough to get cast, it was normally a comedy in which I claim to be the straight man to a comic, or the village idiot. <laughs> when I was transferring into this conference, I said that to the district committee on ordained ministry. And one of the clergy on the committee said, that will prepare you well, Pastor. <laughs> it was also during that time period I got to be involved in committees. I even sat on the PPR committee. I remember those times where we got a new pastor, and I thought, what on earth is the bishop's cabinet thing? And there are other times where we got someone, and I thought, this person fits like a tailor-made glove. And one of the things that struck me during that time period is I appreciated pastors who took the time to get to know the congregation. Pastors who tried to understand what we were like and what our personality was like, what our history was with ministry in that area. And that is very much my style of pastoral leadership. It is collaborative. I am most interested in these first six months to year of getting to know you, of who you are, and what it's like to be in ministry in this particular community. I've had the experience with very strong and powerful personality pastors who stood up in the pulpit on the first day and said, I'm in charge. Get behind me or get out of my way. And I realized over time that there are some parishioners who actually find that comfortable, that kind of strong leadership. I am not alone. I am a collaborator. If you have a question for me about what I will or will not do, then my first question to you is, well, what do you think or what have you done? One tool that we will be able to use that I would like for us to utilize in the fall is choosing the faithful path which is a curriculum I think some of you have talked about before, which is produced by Plot Point Ministries. Plot Point Ministries is a ministry based in North Carolina. Kelly and Beth Crispin are the uh, two people who initiated this nonprofit. And Beth Crispin was just recently made a district superintendent in her conference. And this particular cur curriculum is an 11-week curriculum where we meet in a group and we look at different aspects of the church. Each week involves some sort of mini worship service with a Bible study lesson and the singing of hymns, and on certain times with sharing communion together. And each one looks at a particular area of focus. One looks at worship resources and spiritual resources of the church. Another week looks at material resources and the things that we have. Another week looks at financial resources. Another week looks at our people, our population, and the talents we each bring. And it gives us an opportunity to slowly and methodically look at who we are so that we can be attuned to what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. I am ultimately not interested in telling you what to do or in hearing from you what you think we should do as a church. I am interested as your pastor and having us prayerfully and worshipfully work together so we can determine where the Holy Spirit is leading us. I trained for this particular class in a uh, training that happened here in the Roanoke District. The Daniel District, the Roanoke District, and the Eastern Shore are the three districts in this conference 
that have contracted with Plowpoint Ministries. I happened to do my training in Roanoke because I wasn't available when they did it in Danville because I was gone on a mission trip. This is my fourth appointment here in the Virginia Conference. Whenever I had my first one, I was transferring into the conference, and that was in Winchester. And that means that Dina and I had a 12-hour long car trip with all of our cats in the crates in the back seat <laughs> as we left early that morning from Atlanta and drove all the way up to Winchester. And as we were headed north, when we finally got to this area, we were really tired and a bit cranky. And I was pointing around to Roanoke, and I said, oh, this is where annual conference was this year. And there, there's the conference center where we met. And then Dina said to me, and if this was your appointment, we'd be home now. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know how pathetic I am. <laughs> but we are happy now to have made it home and to be making a home here. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you and finding out together what the Holy Spirit has done for us and what the Holy Spirit has in store in the years ahead. Amen. Amen.